Good evening and welcome to another edition of Harmonics. Tonight's guest, I feel, is one of the great young jazz musicians in California, but not only that, in the United States. I have a very special guest, a good friend, Michael Booker. Hey, how you doing? Chris? Hey, what's up, man? You're looking good. Thanks, look, man. You look a little <laughs> bit tired, man. I know very you're doing much. a lot, man, but hey, man, it's great to have you on, man. Um, Let's get right into it, okay? Sure. You've know. been very busy. What you been doing lately? So basically, I just got back from like a week tomorrow on camp, like in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I've been like, like teaching kids. I've been helping out kids. I've been like pretty much been a counselor to a lot of kids, like around 15 of them. Um, yeah, I've just been like, say, taking care of them for the most part. I've just been walking up and down hills mm -hmm. for the most part. I've just been going on for, I would say a good, Within that eight days or mm -hmm. eight nights, I've been only going off for like 20 hours of sleep for the most part. Well, doesn't that, that's what a jazz musician does, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. basically. Yeah. And, and, you know, so you're talking about kids. Tell me about, like, you. Mm -hmm. What got you, what was really the made you who you are, mm -hmm. and what got you into music at an early age? Well, it all started in elementary school when I was, I forgot what age I was, but I was in the fifth sixth grade as well like we had the little recorders like Mary had a little lamp that was cool and then all the other kids wanted to play instruments I was like oh that's cool instruments are cool and then I saw like oh the cello looks cool but I was I was very shy I didn't know how to speak up and then the teacher gave me a saxophone and played this I'm like okay this is cool as well too um, a couple years down the line I was also like saying to baseball and soccer did all that fun stuff mm -hmm. but then like when I got into middle school I got, I got a little bit heavier into baseball as well, too. I was on winning teams. Some people wanted to recruit me from, like, say, Little League. Um, not just Little League, the Gamers, um, the Babe Ruth League out in East Oakland. My godfather, he wanted me to play on their team. They're really good. I think they almost went to the championship that mm -hmm. year for a little. It was something crazy like that. Um, but to the gist of the point, um, when it, in 2006 or so, five, it was, like, a very rainy year, and, like, pretty much all the baseball games were, like, say, cut in half. So I focused more time on my music than, like, say, actually playing baseball. And then at that point, when I was on a losing team. We only won one game. I wasn't even on that team when we won that. I mean, I wasn't even at that game when we actually won that game. I was just really disappointed in myself. But I focused on music more because that was the right thing, and it felt good. And I was being a little bit rebellious at that time, and, like, I didn't want to play baseball anymore, too. I still love it. I still love the sport, but, like, it's kind of more of a rebellious aspect when I could talk more about that later why okay. I used like the saxophone pedals and stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you were when you're making this progression of feeling at first mm -hmm. in early childhood the music, who were some of the things that influenced you to even get deeper into it at that mm -hmm. age? Or did you have a teacher? I had a teacher and stuff. His name was Milt Bowerman. Um he really taught me a lot. He was a little old and stuff. A little tiny bit slow, but like I learned a lot from him and I'm looking back I'm like oh wow I did this back then I was like that was really cool <laughs> but um yeah he was my main influence I didn't have any influence employers until like say a couple years later in high school actually so when you went to this teacher was he actually teaching you theory and scales and modes or yeah actually without knowing <laughs> <laughs> really? he taught me all that stuff and like I'm learning it I'm relearning it again like now in college I'm looking back at the notes he was showing me and I was like wait a minute I already learned this but somehow I'm not able to pass this class. But, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not my part. But no, he taught me all that stuff. And I was like, dang, OK, that explains a lot. <laughs> so when was actually did you get your first actual, um, was it the first instrument, the saxophone, you yes. said? Yes. So you've always, it's always been your companion, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so when did actually, did you actually uh, start really feeling, what was the, so, some of the songs? What was some of the first songs you learned on a sax? If you can remember, I'm trying to remember that one. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of cheesy songs. Mary had a little lamb. Okay. There's Fela Jacques. 
<laughs> oh, there was Marvel number five. Um, was that? No, that was in the Baja, mm -hmm. man. It was like, I forgot who it was. Mm -hmm. Oh, Killer Joe, actually. Killer Joe, Killer Joe. That was a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Louis Louis, actually. Louis Louis. Louis Louis. Um, I forgot. Uh, Wipeout. Wipeout was another good song. Wipeout was it? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah. So you went through all that little transition. When did you know? That the sax was like in high school, mm -hmm. and when you went to you went to Hayward High. Yes, definitely. Oh, so the you were farmers, in the jazz band, yeah, yeah the farmers, yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. Um, so when you went there uh, in Hayward High, mm -hmm. when did, when did you start doing this and you got into jazz? What were actually going on in your mind right there? Did you wanted to be a first chair or where, however they do it over there? What was it like to be in a jazz band? They didn't really have much of a jazz band there. It was more. I don't want to say, yeah, it was like very rock oriented, very pride oriented. Like say, it was more rock and roll oriented at, at that program. They didn't really focus too much on the musicality of like in terms of scales. It was almost kind of like a step back in terms of musically, but in terms of like people and social skills, it was like say very way hard out there. It was very, I remember being there, it was very hard. I wouldn't say dark, but like, it was very like, okay, you have all these other kids' lives coming into play and you're with them all the time. There's a lot of stuff happening at home with them and then it affects you because you see them like just about every single day and that becomes part of your problem and you have to be able to adjust and, mm -hmm. and deal with that situation. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, all these other kids are playing like guitars, like heavy metal guitars and mm -hmm. stuff and playing all this very grungy, hard rock music and like very hard, grungy hard hip hop music at the time as well too. Mm -hmm. Back in the hi-fi days in the day, the, yeah. So when you were doing that, what, uh, how did you feel in that place of, of being a saxophonist, mm -hmm. having to have rap and also mm -hmm. rock? How did you blend in there? I thought it was cool. Really? I thought it was so cool. I wanted to do that, but I wanted to play the saxophone as well too. Mm -hmm. That was skip a couple years ahead to like say community college that's when i started to venture into using saxophone pedals as well too so, i mean we could st take a couple that could be a little bit later on mm -hmm. in life mm -hmm. like i could just talk about that mm -hmm. as well too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when you went through that transition mm -hmm. uh what were you listening to on record on 33 or cds mm -hmm. what were you actually listening to at that particular time Jimi Hendrix. Jimmy. So, <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tried to do a Hendrix tune on? Yes. on what Which one is that? Castle Made of Sands. Oh, one of my favorite yeah, songs. Yeah, Castle Made of Sands. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I'm going to recommend something to you. I, I want you to go to Seattle to go to the EMP oh, okay. and go, you'd love it, man. Uh, I would really like you to, could you do some of that maybe later on the show, play a little bit of We'll uh, see. I'm, <laughs> I'm very, that song, I'm very rusty at it, so okay. I can tell you that. Okay. So you, you were playing that, mm -hmm. and you like here. Then you came to Chabot. Mm -hmm. You graced our stages. Mm -hmm. You were playing in the jazz band. Mm -hmm. uh, your uh, jazz conductor was a friend of yours and, and mm -hmm. mine also. So how, would, how did that go, that transition? Was that an easy transition for you? From Hayward High School to Chabot, that was a very, that was actually a very blissful trans transition. Um, I was actually very happy just going from there to there because like I was able to breathe more. It was like a lot less stressful on me, I could tell you that. It was mm -hmm. still very hard here mm -hmm. in terms of just getting to classes and doing the schoolwork and then having Dan Zinn as a teacher kicking mm -hmm. my butt every <laughs> every week as well too. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot more jazz here than I did at, in high school. So mm -hmm. listening to Dexter Gordon, oh, Eddie yeah. Harris, John Coltrane, a little bit of Ornette Coleman. I could go into Sun Ra a little bit, Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. The list could go on and on. Yusef Latif, who just passed uh, recently. Yes, yes. I have, I have his album, The mm. 33 and the Third, uh, uh, Around the World. One, yes. One of my favorite albums. Mm. You know, you, you mentioned, and we were talking before we went on the air, mm. uh, you mentioned that uh, Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. Tell me what made you, as a young jazz mm -hmm. musician, what made you uh, aspire to like Miles? Uh, I think it was like, say, the recordings when he played with, um, in, so what in particular actually just how simple everything was and like how beautiful it's like you don't need to play all these crazy notes mm -hmm. and just all these notes it's like simplicity is the key i even preach that to my students and that mm -hmm. one was very simple very easy to the mind to listen to mm -hmm. as well too um what really got me sold on miles davis was the album like Shh in a silent way uh also there's bitches brew that was cool as well too okay. but um but um, the shush in a silent way, that was really the one that like got me sold. It was very cool and very relaxing. 
Also, I heard um, back to Jimi Hendrix. Like mm -hmm. I heard Miles actually wanted to do some work with Jimmy with Jimmy yes. before he passed, yeah. but too bad that didn't happen. You what know? what a collaboration that could have mm -hmm. been. Um, Miles was such an innovator and such a great dresser mm -hmm. and et cetera. And it's, I would just listen to Miles in a silent way and then, um, what is it, Cool World or Cool Blue? I believe so, yeah, Cool Blue. Yeah, it was just really a great, great album. John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. Tell me about John Coltrane, with how he influences you. Yeah. Uh, again, he was, simpl he was like simplicity. Actually, from what I read and like even when I researched about him, he when he played the saxophone, it's as if he was like, say, preaching on his horn, because I remember he was like very religious. It's not religious, like he was like a preacher on the horn. And at the time, I remember like, say, back when he was around or alive, like people very m much like misunderstood him for his play playing. It's like, oh, it's just a bunch of noise. But like, if you just really listen, sit down and listen, not hear, but just listen and examine what he's doing and just the chords and say the while he and the style he's playing, then you would definitely like to hear his message that he's just trying to preach out something way deeper than like say the sound conveys. Did you ever go to the Church of Coltrane in San Francisco? Not yet. Yeah, <laughs> Not yet. there you go. We should go together, <laughs> man. I think it would be a good little trip. Um, Ornette Coleman, mm -hmm. tell me about him, what 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 you how that influences you. And he's way I'm, we're gonna talk about Sun Ra yeah. too, too. <laughs> you know. Ornette Coleman. Um I was recommended by, I forgot who it was. Mm -hmm. It was by like, it, it was one of my friends actually. It was like, oh, check out Ornette Coleman. I'm like, okay. And then I put up, up and it's like, it's like, oh wow, this is very out there. Mm -hmm. Very out there stuff. I was like, very cool. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Um, what can I say about Ornette Coleman? Um, yeah, he was a great, great, great saxophone player. I believe, I forgot what year it was, but there was like, say certain, there was like a couple of jazz CDs. There was like three or four of them. Mm -hmm. I forgot the guy that just passed away. Um, he did um, take five, I believe. I forgot his name, but he had a CD that came out around, around the same time. Then mm -hmm. Aham, uh -huh, I believe. Brubeck? Not Brubeck. Yeah, Dave, yeah, yeah Br it was Brubeck. It was Brubeck, yeah. It was Brubeck, Ornette Coleman. Oh, gosh, there was a third CD. Mm -hmm. Brubeck, Ornette Coleman, and then Aham uh -huh by, um, I believe it was Char Charles Mingus. Mm -hmm. Charles Mingus, boy, that's it. Was there was a f and there was a four C fourth C I believe it was a My Miles Davis I forgot what it was mm -hmm. but I remember I wanted to collect all those I, f I saw it like in a documentary somewhere mm -hmm. like just those four CDs like they really after that year that's really changed the landscape of jazz mm -hmm. as well as this Sun Ra Sun Ra to me is growing up was mm -hmm. uh, sort of like the jazz Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. you know I mean he took me out into outer space a couple mm -hmm. times. Sun Ra, you mentioned earlier that Sun Ra also affected you. Mm -hmm. How? My dad actually mentioned it to me. Thank you, Dad. Uh, <laughs> he saw him live once. He said, like, it was a crazy experience. Mm -hmm. Man, I don't know what drugs they were on back then. <laughs> but he uh, actually didn't do drugs. drugs. <laughs> yeah. He, he was very out. The, I liked him a lot because I really felt like he was the one that inspired Hendrix and Miles Davis and, like, Ornette Coleman just to go into that crazier route as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, it made s at first like with all these artists i didn't it didn't make sense but then mm -hmm. after a while i was like okay this stuff is definitely starting to make sense to me like mm -hmm. okay he goes outside but at the same time he had a very much like say educational background in terms of the arts and just yes. appreciating the, the artists behind him as well yes. too yes um you're talking Even about his style as well oh too. god his yeah. style well he also influenced uh Parliament, Funkadelic. Funkadelic, yes. You know, and, and they used to have, back in the day when your dad and I were uh, young gentlemen, mm. uh, they used to have cool the Cool Jazz Festival, and mm. you could see stuff that was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. So today now, who do you listen to? What in, uh, you know, you're like your own plateau of things, and you're still always mm -hmm. learning, like you said earlier. Who influences you now, or do you just listen or hear? For the most part, I listen and hear. Mm -hmm. I've been getting into a lot of Kamasi Washington. He's the new saxophonist. He's been doing works with Flying Lotus, um, Kendrick Lamar in particular, mm -hmm. and Thundercat, mm -hmm. who's also a very big influence, like very big influence right now in terms of like even rap. I like Little B, the bass guy. He's from Berkeley, mm -hmm. in particular. Um, in terms of jazz, there's personally there's not as many players out. There. I mean, right. maybe my teacher Dan Zinn because I'm studying under him. I'm mm -hmm. learning. A lot of concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, but Kam Kamasi Washington, that has to be one. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of Chris Potter here and there. Uh, 
that's about it for right now. Actually. So let's talk about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. What's the project that you're doing right now? I know you're in a few <laughs> projects, but tell me some of the stuff that you're doing right now. Okay. So I'm in a duo that's been going on and off, but we've been on for the most part. So we pretty much, we doodle in terms of the facts of Ornette Coleman a little bit as well too. Like the Ryan, like Ryan, my drummer, he does a lot of free stuff, very, very free, but at the same time, he's pretty much on point when it comes to the metronome. He's a very, very, very crazy dude. And with him, he's like pretty much laying out a layer of just like, he's like pretty much laying out the dirt. Mm -hmm. And I'm laying out all the flowers and all the rainbows and the clouds and the airplanes going over a head and stuff. A lot more simplistical stuff over the head. He's very complex at the bottom, he's like the volcano. And and then pretty much out the volcano comes out all the dirt, which makes him the dirt and the foundation of it as well. But at the same time, if he wants to take a break, I could definitely like say lay something on top of there as well. I deal with a whammy pedal, which which deals with octaves as well too. But at the same time, I deal with a space echo pedal, which is pretty much like say a delay and a re reverb type of effect. Mm -hmm. What actually my evolution of that right now? We did a lot in the beginning. We did a lot more heavier crazy out there stuff that didn't really make any sense. That was like a good two, three years ago. But now it's making a whole lot more s sense. Now, like say, if you listen to a lot of uh, Bach chorales, like say, if you like hit a lower note, I'm gonna let that lower note ring out. And at the same time, I could sprinkle some st stuff on top of it. And that's how I'm able to play like say two, three hour more gigs now as well. That's only a little piece of the cake of right. what I do. But mm -hmm. um, we could do it into like say something very heavy, it's like okay, I could do it in a minor key, play it a little bit faster, build up, build up, build up. Maybe I could drop the bass a little bit, and I could go into it like a yeah. type, of type of scream of that bitch feel. But right. it's crazy. Maybe. I can tell you that. So uh, I've heard you both play, and you're both excellent. Mm -hmm. you're, you're really excellent. You're inspiring in mm -hmm. many ways. Um, what else are you up to besides? Are you recording a CD? I understand, or have you recorded that CD? We have, and we have it. We need to edit it a lot more. Um, it's good. It's really good. We have Thomas Pridgen who played with Mars Volta on it as well too. There should be some other players as well on there. Um, that one's in the works. It's been on and off in the works because we have our own projects going on. I'm dealing with, excuse me, I'm dealing with school and the pet band up at Cal State Hayward mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the other projects I'm doing. I'm in a ska band right now too, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just like playing in front of people as well mm -hmm. too. They're doing great and mm -hmm. they're. I'm about to play at Gilman, actually. Not this Friday, but next Friday. Really? Well too. I'm about to do a house show in Santa Cruz, which I don't even know what's going to happen. House, house shows are, are some of the best. You'll find that out. Let's, let's, let's change a little channel because you just said a little something that just kind of sparked into me. Mm -hmm. MLB, Major League Baseball. I'm watching the World Series last year, <laughs> and all of a sudden, Michael Booker. Michael, tell me about all of that and how that originated. You guys are some really some of the best. Oakland has great fans, the hardcore. Tell me how that all evolved. So basically, before that commercial, I was on, I was actually at an A's game. I believe it was around a year ago from now. And basically one of the batter's names was Josh Reddick. His walk-up theme song was Careless Whisper. And pretty much, I think there was a couple other sax ones that did it beforehand. They brought their sax to the game, but they weren't really consistent. And I guess the people weren't really feeling it with them mm -hmm. in the fan and the right field bleachers. Mm -hmm. So I decided like, hey, you know, it'd be pretty funny if I just brought my alto saxophone and I'm going to go every time he goes up the bat, I'm going to play, I'm going to play Careless Whisper. And pretty much after he, the song went off, I just kept playing and playing and playing. So there was a good four, maybe even five times while he was playing, while he was up at bat, I was just playing it. And what's interesting, everyone in the family, in the section, they had their own fake little saxophones. And the announcer guy was like, oh, wow, that's actually a real saxophone. And so basically what was very funny about it, my phone kept blowing up, blowing up, blowing up, even with my dad. It's like, Michael, da-da-da-da-da-da. I'm like, I'm still going to keep playing. Okay. We had a great time. We won by like 20 points. I'm trying to remember that game. It was a really, it might have been against the Red Sox. That might have been Excellent. a couple years ago. That's even better. But, and then after that game, <laughs> then I guess they decided to use that footage and then put me on the World Series, and my phone blew up again. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're excellent. You know, what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do right now, because Michael is such a gifted artist, I'm gonna have Michael play, and then I'm gonna jump back in like jazz, you know. Like Miles would always say, there's no bad notes, just play it. You know, just play it. So I'm gonna let Michael play what he does best, and I'm going to step off, and Michael's going to take center stage. So uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. 
I'm one on Monkey Guy. The chance of being involved in a robbery is 1 in 757. The chances of being struck by lightning is 1 in 750,000. These fasten your seatbelts for unexpected turbulence. The chances of being a victim in an airline crash? 1 in 29 million. Hey, could I get some peanuts? The chances of being involved in a car crash are far greater than lightning strikes and plane crashes. And if you are texting while driving, your risk of crash increases 23 times. Now, I may be an unlucky guy, but I don't have to be part of that statistic, and neither do you. Drive responsibly.